Now at six, two decades of ideas and no results. Today, Oregon and Washington officials got back to work to figure out what to do about the I-5 bridge. And a vote tonight on whether police should spend more time in schools. We'll explain this plan and why it's so controversial. And the changing face of Northeast Portland. We have a look at what will become of the old Pepsi plant on Sandy Boulevard. You are in prison, yes, you did something wrong. But we still have to treat you like humans. A Beaverton family won't have their mom this Christmas. She died from organ failure caused by the flu. It happened behind bars, and they're blaming our state prison system for not giving her a flu shot. It's turned now into a lawsuit for wrongful death, and the family wants seven and a half million dollars. KGW's Nina Melhoff talked with this woman's family, and Nina, they're angry that this is how she died, something that's preventable. Yeah, and they argue if she would have gotten that flu shot in prison, something she religiously got when she was free, she would still be alive. Yeah, it's kind of hard to have pictures of her out. Mistina Ferry only has memories of her mom this holiday season. At my softball games, I'd hit a home run. She'd stand up and be like, that's my kid. And I'm like, mom, stop. But now it's like, I, I wish I could hear that for my son, but I, I won't ever hear that. Tina Ferry was a Beaverton grandma and a mother of three, married to her husband 28 years. Her life came crashing down in 2017 when a fairly new meth problem caused her to crash into cars in a school parking lot, injuring herself and a man waiting to pick up a child. She pleaded guilty and was at Coffee Creek Prison when a flu outbreak swept through. Ferry got sick and when she didn't call home after a few days, Mistina called the prison. They point blank were like, oh, everything's fine. Everything's absolutely fine. If something was wrong, we would let you know. And it was less than 12 hours later. We got the phone call saying that they didn't know how much time she had left. Ferry was rushed to the hospital. Up until probably like 45 minutes before she died, they still had her shackled to the bed. Mistina's wrongful death lawsuit wants seven and a half million dollars in damages. It says the prison only got 500 some flu shots for 1600 inmates. The experts tell us that when you're in confined spaces like prisons, at least 70% of the population needs to receive flu shots. In this case, less than a third did. It accuses the prison of violating state policy in doing nothing to tell inmates they could have a shot. Instead, it alleges that inmates had to ask for the vaccine. Most didn't even know they could ask. As we understand it, it was a cost saving measure. These were $7 flu shots and the prison officials just chose not to buy enough flu shots for every inmate. I want things to change there. I don't want anybody to ever have to feel this way again. I don't care if it's their mom, their sister, their aunt, uncle, brother, whatever. Nobody should have been treated the way my mom was treated and nobody should ever be dealt with like that, ever. I don't care if they're in prison. I don't. The Department of Corrections told me it can't comment. The ferry's attorney does say Oregon prisons have started changing, notifying inmates much better now about flu shots. But Mistina says at $7 a pop, it is so much cheaper to offer everyone a shot than someone to die. And then a huge lawsuit. Dan. Nina, thank you. We have some new information now about a fatal shooting in Clark County yesterday. We've learned now that the victim is 18 year old Gage Kaiser from Vancouver. Police arrested a 17 year old who they say was the getaway driver. Officers arrested him this morning. He's being charged as an accomplice to murder. The shooter, though, is still out there. Investigators believe everyone involved did know each other. They say that this was probably a drug deal gone bad. Right now, the Portland Public School Board is set to vote on a plan that would increase the time that police officers spend inside schools. But some parents and students are pushing back, saying this will make them feel more unsafe. KGW's Mike Benner is live at district headquarters with more on this, Mike. Well, Laurel, that meeting is starting right now, and before any vote, there will be time for public testimony. So if you come on down, uh, you can 
get in front of the school board and give your opinion. In the meantime, let's get uh, right to the numbers. If the plan gets the school board's uh, stamp of approval tonight, it'll cost the school district $364,000 for the rest of the school year and about $1.2 million each of the next three school years. Now, this plan does not add more school resource officers. Instead, it increases the amount of time they can spend in the schools. So nine school resource officers will spend five days in the school instead of just three. District leaders say school resource officers are invaluable as they're specially trained. They focus on restorative justice and they help prevent students from getting caught up in the justice system. Opponents say armed officers spending more time in the schools will make students and teachers feel less safe. Again, tonight's meeting is kicking off right now. There will be public testimony and we'll have the very latest on KGW News at 11. For now, back to you. More, more from Mike later tonight. Appreciate it, sir. So local lawmakers met today. They're discussing one of the most contentious political topics in recent years, a replacement I-5 bridge over the Columbia River. KGW's Devin Haskins joins us now. Devin, they say this idea is a different one. Yeah, five years ago, the Columbia River crossing was a failed $175 million research project that didn't gain a majority of support up north in Olympia. Republican law Washington lawmakers backed away after years of planning. This time, though, both sides of the aisle and river are coming together. If you've ever used the notoriously bottleneck bridge with traffic backed up for miles daily, you can sympathize with your fellow drivers. We won't go to Portland uh, if it's before nine or it's after two, just because we get caught over there and it doesn't make it worth the effort to go. For years, it's just been too crowded and it, it needs to be fixed. Traffic sucks. I mean, even in the middle of the day, it's backed up. Seven years ago, KGW asked supporters behind the CRC project when we could be driving on the new bridge. About 2018, we'd have the one bridge open and the full thing would be open in about 2020. The bridge obviously never happened and lawmakers went back to the tables. Three years ago, Washington Governor Jay Inslee approved funding to create the Oregon-Washington Legislative Action Committee funding that would bring both states together to look at past failures. This is a completely new plan. Uh, the CRC uh, no longer has federal funding, no longer has uh, support of uh, our two states, doesn't have funding uh, available. So this is a redo. Today's meeting was more like a show and tell. Washington senators showing Oregon senators what they've studied the last three years. And that's why I'm so excited about this effort. I think that uh, it, we're setting ourselves up very well for uh, uh, getting to that final goal of a, a new bridge that's going to serve uh, generations to come. This generation, drivers just want something to be done and fast. I hope they've had five years to think about it and that they can come to a solution. I really do. Now this will take time. How the project will be funded and what the bridge will look like still need to be uh, decided. And if this uh, this time, if all goes well, we're still years away from any sort of groundbreaking. Back to you. All big questions, and there's a big question about light rail, so let's hope they can find some common ground. Thank you, Devin. Today is the six-year anniversary of the deadly shooting at Clackamas Town Center. In honor of the victims, gun safety advocates are calling for support for a bill in the Oregon legislature. It would require gun owners to lock their guns. The gunman in the Clackamas Town Center shooting stole an unlocked gun from a friend's house. Paul Kemp spoke at a news conference today. His brother-in-law, Steve Forsyth, is one of two people who died in the shooting. I am a gun owner and have been for most of my life. Responsible gun owners always safely secure their weapons when not being carried or used. It is time that all gun owners do that. There have to be consequences for those reckless and careless gun owners who don't secure their firearms when it leads to injury and death of others. The proposed bill is named after Forsyth and the other victim, Cindy Yule. The group is hoping it will pass in the 2019 session. Someone's been leaving nails in the road in Oregon City for almost a year now, and police have offered a $1,000 reward to try and find out who's doing it. People first started noticing this last January, and it's happened several times since then. In fact, to see the video, our crews found some galvanized roofing nails this morning at 13th and Washington. Oregon City Police say whoever's doing this is targeting morning commuters between 5.30 and 7 a.m. Police want it to stop and neighbors do too. 
real angry about people putting stuff like that in the road. Yeah. Save it and build a house with it or something. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't throw it out in the road, my God. I like that guy. Now, if you know who's doing this, you can help police catch and uh, prosecute them. Call the Oregon City Police tip line. We posted the number at KGW.com. I wonder, though, if it's just some handyman with a broken toolbox in the back of his pickup truck, you know, driving to work every morning. We'll find out, yeah. perhaps. Well, parts of Northeast Sandy Boulevard is about to get a lot more crowded. Developers want approval for as many as 1,200 apartments on the site of the Pepsi blocks. Let's take a look at the map. We'll show you where it is here. Uh, they're located roughly between Northeast 25th and Northeast 27th. That's along Sandy Boulevard. The area got its name from the old Pepsi bottling plant there. KGW's Pat Doris is live there now with a look at what's to come, Pat. Well, Dan, the building with the iconic sign on it is going to stay, but that's about it. Everything else is eventually going to be torn down. It's not going to happen overnight, but significant change is coming here. For decades, the Pepsi company spread out over nearly five acres here in northeast Portland. This is where the company had a bottling plant and still runs a warehouse. This iconic building is 56 years old and will be preserved and made into a public pavilion, but the rest will go away. By far the largest uh, planned development we've seen come to Sandy Boulevard. Chuck Slothauer covers so development far, for the Daily Journal of Commerce. He said the acres. plans for the Pepsi blocks will change the entire area. It'll probably change the feel of that neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Sandy area will have a lot more residents. Uh, you'll see uh, some parks and open spaces in there, along with some retail. These are sketches of what's to come sent to us by the designers, the Mithen Company from Seattle. The future site will hold as many as 1,200 apartments, along with shops and maker spaces, and a park and that public pavilion. Last week, Portland's Design Commission gave an important green light to the plan. I talked with the principal designer today over FaceTime. He said it will be respectful to the neighborhood. And so our goal is to uh, work within the context of the neighborhood and uh, create a, a community that fits in well, uh, but does look to the future. But some I talked with are worried about all those people who will move here. Paul Hylas said he's lived nearby for 30 years. I don't know, Ed. We'll just have to wait and see how bad it's really, really going to get, but it's definitely changed a lot. And Marina, who owns Marina's Cafe, worries about traffic and parking, but admits it will probably bring her more customers. Wow. Well, all those car dealerships are gone. There were a lot of them along Sandy. A lot of offices are gone, so now it's just residential. Some common questions. Yes, there will be underground parking at the development and there will be some affordable units. It's not going to happen overnight. It could take as long as 10 years to have it built out completely, depending on what the economy does. Back to you. Well, that's close to our neck of the woods, Pat, and we certainly have seen a lot of changes over recent right. years. Thank you, Pat. We have some good news in Southern Oregon for you. A snowboarder missing since Sunday has been found alive. 27-year-old Eli Kepsel went snowboarding at Mount Ashland Sunday and then didn't show up to work Monday. He was out on the mountain alone. Just before noon today, the Jackson County Sheriff's Office says a search team found Eli alive. He's at the hospital getting treatment for hypothermia, but otherwise, he's okay. Let's hope he makes a full recovery. That's scary. So still ahead, a lot of people shopping. Hey, it's the holidays. Buying refurbished electronics, as you know, can save you a lot of money, but is it all worth it? We're going to ask a consumer advocate if the product justifies the price cut. Plus, a local nonprofit needs your help this Christmas. Their ambitious goal to help Portland families in need. And I'm Matt Safino. Hey, we had some sun today for about 20 seconds out of the Oregon coast. That was Cannon Beach. Still a lot of rain going through. In fact, some heavy rain and even some wind damage. We've got the pictures.